So this morning, um, I've got the privilege to present one of the topics in our series. And I want to use this opportunity to welcome everyone that is online on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, Live Gate Outreach TV, Boss Proud, whichever online platform you're, you've, you've used to connect to Live Gate Outreach Sunday service today. Um, please be blessed and we have you in mind and the Lord bless you as you also listen. I've got the privilege of bringing one of the topics today, the power of humility in our series, Developing the Mind of Christ. When I came back in January, I met a series we were running, um, Access to Divine Creativity. And there were a lot of good topics there, and I listened to a whole lot of messages that I missed. Then, Developing the Mind of Christ, then Pastor has looked at... Um, um, taking the form of a bond servant. And he has also looked at becoming all things to all men. Uh, he said last Sunday that Paul was doing so many odds to win some. The church is doing so many some and hoping to win all. <laughs> that one has just sang. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So this period we are going to be doing so many, many all just to win some. And 19th of April, we're going to do one of the so many sums to see who can win. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So today we're looking at the power of humility. The power of humility. And we're going to look at how God looks at humility. And what God defines as pride. We're also going to look at the vital components that can generate or develop humility in our lives. I am listening as I'm speaking to you at the same time because it's the Holy Ghost speaking now. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, you cannot base the definition of humility or pride within your own context as a man. Because what one culture sees as pride and humility is different from what another culture sees as pride and humility. Because you see, culture regulates people's interpretations and perceptions. Culture. It has power to regulate people's judgment and people's perceptions and people's interpretations of things. So because there are varying cultures in um, different geographical locations, you cannot use your interpretation of humility and pride. You can't generalize, you can't generalize that interpretation. It will be faulty in some circumstances. But it's in the Bible is what tells us what pride is. I'll give you an example. I've got a friend who came from a culture. Well, if you must greet an elder, you must bow your head. Or you even flung on the floor. Okay? Some of you knows what I'm talking about already. Are you smiling? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Then there's another culture that greeting an elder and bowing your head or flung it on the floor is a disrespect. Okay? And this brother wants to marry this lady. In this country, I don't mean another country here. But of course, they've come from Africa. The parents have come from Africa. And this lady had, of course, briefed the fiancé of how to meet the dad and how to greet him and all that. The first time of visiting the house, the lady has told the parents, I've got somebody coming to see you people. I think I am okay with him and all that. And he arrived. Expectation was high. Dinner, everything has been prepared. He came. The moment he saw the dad put hand and it almost destroyed the entire relationship. He exemplified his own culture. Immediately the countenance of the dad changed and he took the daughter inside. He said, did you bring this young man here to insult me? Though he's been here for quite a while. But you see, the culture where he came from still dominates his judgment. And, of course, everything went so awry that day. But it took time. It delayed the wedding plan. It took time to correct that impression. 
for him to understand, okay, in this culture, this is how it's been done. He still, you know, scolded the daughter. He said, but you would have briefed him very well that that is unacceptable in our culture. So we can use our culture to, these two people are my friends, so I know what I'm telling you. It's not just they told me. Uh, it's something that came and we needed to pray about it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So you can use your, culture, your, your interpretation of pride or humility to know exactly what that is. Because human perspective on humility distorts the divine idea of what exactly it is. Let's look at, um, let's first of all look at what God calls pride. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter number 12. In case it's not projected, I would like you to be very swift with your Bible this morning. When we read in our Bible reading, Luke chapter 12, the Bible says, in verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, Luke chapter 12 and verse 13, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to him, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. In case all your pursuit in life is materialism, Jesus said, that your life doesn't have to consist or does not consist or will never consist in the abundance of the things you possess. Then he said, he spoke a parable. He said, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid off for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and marry. And but God said to him, verse 20, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Anytime you take God out of your equation, no matter, you know, regardless of your status in society, no matter your status financially, Anytime you take God out of the question of your life, that's what God sees as rebellion. He sees it as pride. Anytime you want to advance any cause depending on your self-sufficiency without acknowledging God in that particular adventure, whatever it is, God sees it as pride. And among the seven things the Bible said God hated, one is proud look. Proud. One is to be proud. Now the Bible says, God said to him, this man, Jesus himself recognized him as a rich man. He said, a certain rich man. So Jesus was saying, economically he was settled. Materially he was settled. This man was no longer pursuing things. He already has sufficiency. He has enough already to, 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 to sustain him for his lifetime. Rather than thinking, blessing God and giving God praise, and looking for the reason God has blessed him for such, with such an abundance, looking for those, because the reason for blessing is that you become a blessing. If you're blessed and you're not a blessing, I'm telling you, God is warning you because he's going to terminate it. Uh, you see, David said, I've been young and, and, and I'm now old. He said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Well, I, I'm not old, but I've been young and I've, I continue to be young, right? But I have watched people's lives who negate the scripture. They go up and they fall. The Bible said, I will bless you and you will become a blessing. So until you become a blessing, you're not really blessed. The definition of your being blessed is that you have extended it to support someone else. That's what validates your blessing. Praise the Lord. So Jesus said that this man is rich. But look at what this man did. 
He said, verse 19, I will say to my soul, bragging. Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. If I use the tongue of pastor, man, I've got it, man. Man, I'm loaded, man. What's the costless car now? What's the costless car? Lamborghini. Okay, pastor likes that one. Praise the Lord. <laughs> right. This man said, I am made, man. I'm made. So what am I going to do? I will make merry. He began to brag. He didn't even put God into the equation at all. And God said, tonight, I am terminating that pride. God said, tonight, because the Bible said, when pride cometh, he said, then shame cometh. When pride cometh, then shame follows. Proverbs chapter, um, Proverbs eleven twenty nine. Proverbs eleven twenty nine. Oh, 11, 12. Praise the Lord. Maybe I'm missing it. But the scripture says, when pride cometh, then shame cometh. That's what the Bible says. But with the lowly, with the humble, the Bible said it's wisdom. Now this Bible says, and that man saw that night was gone. Let us look at Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. Again, what God calls pride. Daniel chapter 5. Look at verse 18. Verse 18. Daniel 5, 18. O king, Okay, let's let's look at let's go to let's go to okay, let's read from 18. Oh king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father a kingdom. Something has happened in the kingdom of this Belshazzar. But he was still acting in the same similitude that the dad acted. And God punished him. Look at it, he said, Oh king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory, and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Verse 19. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. Whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, in what? In what? The Bible says he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. He said, then he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like the beast and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. When pride cometh, shame cometh. Praise the Lord. Now the Bible says in verse 22, but you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. You've not learned from what buffeted your father. You've not learned from the issues that your dad had. Things that shook his kingdom. He said, but you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. Although you knew all this. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house. Before you and you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. He said, then the fingers of the hand were, were sent from him. He said, what you're seeing on the wall, verse 25, that inscription, many, many take care of fasting. He said, the one who you've not glorified is the one that's written those 
by the wall. You see, when we live our lives, we think we're not being watched. Every thought, remember the Bible says he would do exceedingly and abundantly. Ephesians chapter 3, right? The last verse. It said he would do exceedingly and abundantly above all. We do what? We ask or what? So he doesn't just look into your request alone. He also answers your thinking. Your thoughts. So your thoughts are also part of what God brings to his throne. Not just the prayers. It's that what we ask or think. Because the asking is an expression of the thought, isn't it? So the Bible says, it's a many, many take care of fasting. It said, this is the interpretation of each word. It said, many is that, though your kingdom looks fresh and greener, but God has counted your kingdom and has finished it. In the physical, he was still looking as though everything was all right. But in the realm of the spirit, the kingdom was already finished. The Bible says, take care. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. God weighs us in balances every now and then, every day of our lives. He tries to know whether you have him in your equation of that business plan you're writing. Because the Bible says the body without the spirit is dead. What, no matter what it is, whether it's business or life or academic progression or career, if it's as a body but there's no living spirit, it would not survive. It would not survive. The Bible says, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Paris is here, verse 28, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And the Bible says, in verse 30, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. Same night. This is what God calls pride. For the sake of time, we're not going to go into all the scriptures. This is what God calls pride. When you've gotten everything that you need in life, or when you're making a plan to advance a particular cause, or to initiate an investment, or to raise a home, and God is not part of your consideration. God defines it as pride. As what? Pride. Because the psalmist said, I will look unto the hills. No matter the adventure, where will my help come from? Where will it come from? From God. Is it from my mind? Would the help come from my mind? No. The, the help will not come from my analytical um, power or ability to analyze situations. No. My help will not come from research to gather data and information up on that for that particular investment. No. The Bible says whatever adventure I want to get into, my help, if I look to the hill, what happens? He said, there will my help come from. Because he is the maker of the heavens and the earth. So he governs this atmosphere, though through man. But he commands what happens, though through man. Praise the Lord. Now look at, let's look at another thing. If we go to Matthew 20. Matthew 20, let's look at how Jesus modeled humility and what God called humility. Matthew 20. Matthew 20. Look at verse from 24. From 24. The Bible says, and when the ten heard it, they were greatly disple displeased with the two brothers. You know what it is? These were disciples. These were not unbelievers now. Disciples of Christ. The Bible says, secretly they've come with their mother, the two sons of Zebedee, if you read backward. 
They've come to ask Jesus secretly. They didn't want other disciples to hear their request. Because he was a very ambitious one. They said, would you grant that one of my sons sit at the right hand and the other one at the left? You know, some of the disciples understood the gravity of this request. They, they understood the, 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 the depth of this request. And how he could possibly um, um, disable few of their chances around Messiah. And the scripture said, when the ten that was remaining heard about that request, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers, the two sons of Zebedee. The Bible said, when Jesus called them to himself and said, but Jesus called them to himself and said, when thoughts you don't know where they're coming from rises within you, go back to the Lord. Approach the Lord. He will sort out that thought. The Bible said this thought were in their heart. They were displeased. Jesus called them to himself. You know, if we're sensitive and we hear the Holy Spirit, anytime something strange rises within, you will always hear him speak to you. Because Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them. My sheep hears my voice. So if it's a question of not being able to hear the Lord, then it's time to examine whether you are actually a sheep. Because the verdict that my sheep will hear my voice. It's a verdict. It's a divine verdict settled. The Bible says, forever, oh God, thy word is settled and settled in heaven. So it's a verdict that is settled that my sheep will hear my voice. If you're not hearing, you need to go back today and re-examine why is it that is in John chapter 10. Read it with the Holy Ghost. He will tell you why. You're not hearing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now the Bible says Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over themselves. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whosoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. To give his life a ransom for many. I wrote something here. The word ransom there is lutron in Greek rendition. And it means the, pride of rede the price of redeeming. It means the price of redeeming. It means payment for slaves and captives. Liberation from penalty of sin and misery. Jesus said his life has become a ransom. And did he not say, as the heavenly father has sent me, so sent are you. So he has extended that, um, that image of being of that personality of being a ransom to be able to redeem people who are under captive and bondages he extended it to the church as the father has sent me to be a ransom so also i've sent you to be what a ransom that you may be able to save some that you may be able to bring people out of bondage and out of chain because the bible said that our soul is escaped. As a bird out of the snares of the fowler. If there's an escaping, then there's an imprisonment. There is what? An imprisonment. He said, our soul. So your soul escaped because someone else became a ransom for you. Because when people are held, they lose the ability and power to free themselves. They need external force to let them lose. That's what the Bible says, where the spirit of the Lord is. That's liberty. What is liberty? Liberty on you? No, liberty on those who are still imprisoned. Your soul is escaped. Now, your soul did not just escape to be like that man in chapter 12 of Luke. Your soul escaped so that you have the ability and propensity and proficiency and power to be able to save those 
who are bound. Because the Bible says that that snare is broken. Who broke it? That snare is broken. And the Bible says, and we are escaped. So, if our soul escaped as a bird out of the snares of the fowler, the fowler is still in existence today. He has not terminated his existence. Jesus has not returned yet. So, the fowler still possesses the ability to oppress men and women. That's why Jesus said, you have to be. He said, I am here not to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. And he said, as my father has sent me, even so. So today, if you don't know you're meant to be a ransom for the lives of others. And to be a ransom has responsibilities. He has spiritual responsibilities. To be a ransom. One of the responsibilities is that you must have an unbroken secret place where you relate with God. Because being a ransom is not fun. It's not what? It's not fun. You want to know? Jesus was praying to be to be to be excluded from being a ransom and blood. He swear the Bible says was turned into blood. He wanted to relinquish it. It's not fun. So you've got to have a secret place where you communicate constantly, consistently with the Lord. To be able to sustain you because one challenge. Let me read the scripture to you. Second Corinthians. I read the scripture. Second Corinthians chapter 7. Second Corinthians 7 and verse 5. Look at what Paul said. Paul said, for indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. A ransom. Our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. How many side? You know why? Let me tell you. You know, you know, you know, James unveils some deep truths. When you have time, take time. Don't just read the letters of the word. Because that is subject to human intellectualism. Try to gain access to the spirit of the word. And that you don't just get on a platter of gold. Sometimes you fast and pray just to understand the word. You're not asking for anything. Because there's some level of presence you need. And that is what defines... What? Ah. You know, James said something. James said, James said, do you not know that to be friendship with this world is to be enmity, it to be is to be in enmity with God. So it means that when you are friendship with God then you become an enemy to this world. Is that correct? So it means that everything in this world will fight you because you are ah, you are they're saying, they're, they're saying you are someone that's trans, you are, you are what, what, what was the right word? You're trans, what's it? Huh? No, I said you're trying to invade another person's territory. You're just passing. That's the right word. Thank you. That's, you know, it's good to have doctors in the house. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you see, they, they see you as a trespasser. Someone who is trespassing from another dimension to this dimension. So when you want to be a ransom, you need to really sit down and count the cost. You know, Jesus said, anyone that wants to follow me, what will he do? Huh? He should carry his own what? That is the burden of being a ransom. Paul said, our bodies had no rest, but were troubled on every side. He said, outside were conflicts, inside were fears. He said, but nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast is the water penance 
the word tapenos in Greek. That word there is metaphoric, metaphorically used. It's not just meaning downcast. It means God that comforts the humble. God that lifts up the humble. He said the one that comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of another brother. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, we're going to look at quickly. There are too many things here, but I've got no time to share them. So, that's what Jesus calls humility. What God defines as humility is your ability to submit everything about you in the interest of the kingdom. To be able to tolerate, though humanly you're not supposed to. You know the most difficult one? I was sharing with one of my friends one day. When you know that someone is outrightly against you, perpetually, you still have responsibility to love and do good to that person, though you know. Have you been there? It's very, it's very, if you want to, if you want to approach it humanly, you will respond like a human. You know why? The dimension of your oppression as a Christian is not within the third dimensional realm. It's beyond the world. So you cannot afford to behave the way the world behaves. That's what, Jesus, that's what James said, that to be friendly, to be friendship with the world is an enmity. Because the tradition of this world does not conform to the tradition in the realm of the spirit. No. The realm of the spirit expresses liquid love irrespective of what is happening. That's what the Bible says. Why, we're yet, why we were yet sinners. In the very act. The brother woman that committed adultery with stones. They said, Master, we caught her in the very act. What? Humanly. They said the law of Moses. Humanly. Interpretation of logos without the spirit. Humanly. The one who is in the spirit wrote down. Stooped down and wrote. The only one without sin. And in first, he's speaking the language of the, of the you know, dimension beyond the third realm. That's what he's doing. And when they all disappeared, he asked the woman, where are thine accusers? The language of love. He said, they are no longer here, master. He said, neither do I. Neither. Neither. That is the language. So, no matter what has happened, look at Jesus on the cross. I want you to understand what you've signed into. You signed into Christianity. You didn't know what you signed into. <laughs> it's deep. I pray that God will open our understanding to understand this Christianity and what it is. Look at Jesus on the cross, piercing his side. Father, forgive them, for they know not. Eh? Blood is coming out and they don't know. Ah, yeah. They are sending me to the grave and they don't know. Is that a language from human intellectualism? No. It's a language of the spirit. And brother, you see, every communication in the scripture that Jesus gave would only produce results when you operate from that realm. If you quote it from this realm, you won't have results. Father, you said you will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. From this realm, it would not work, I'm telling you. I can guarantee you, you won't get results. But speak it from the realm beyond the true dimension. Then you find out the efficacy of the word and how it works. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Where we read in our Bible reading. Look at, look at, look at. I just want, that's a place I want to bring out here. Um, and verse 5. Look at verse 5. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. See, he had the opportunity to glorify himself, but he did not. The Bible says he did not glorify himself 
to become high priest, but he was. But it was he who said to him, You are my son, today have I begotten thee. Look at verse 7. The Bible says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. The Bible said, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. You see, when you tolerate some things, you know you're not just supposed to tolerate. You feel like unchristening yourself, if that's a word like that. Yes. Unchristening. You can research on it. I know we've got a lot of researchers. Now, the Bible says he suffered many things. You see, he came to do something in the lives of those who never understood that every step he took was for their good. They countered it. That's the suffering. It's so painful when you're trying to help, support somebody, guide somebody, help somebody. When you're working out your life just to make sure someone is supporting, yet that person is a rebellion. That person is a rebel. Or is in rebellion. It can drain, can destroy emotionally. And if your emotional strength is destroyed, you might not function. It's psychological. That's what they call depression. The Bible says he learned obedience through the things he suffered. Now, let's quickly look at four things that develops humility. Four things that develops humility. Number one is brokenness and contrition. Number one is what? Brokenness and contrition. We might not be able to read all the scriptures now, but if the projectors, um, if, if the people, if the media is fast, they can project for us. Um, uh, Psalms chapter 51, verse, if you look at verse 10, 16 to 19. The Bible says, a broken and a contrite heart. God will not despise. Psalm 51. Psalm 51, please, on the screen, if you don't mind. Psalm 51. Verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steward, a steadfast spirit within me. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Verse 16. Verse 16. It says, for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The next verse. 17, please. The next verse. It said, the sacrifices of God are what? Broken spirit and what? A broken and a contract are these. These God will not despise. This is what tells God how humble you are before him. Brokenness and contrition. Brokenness because sacrifices means nothing to God without brokenness. Burnt offerings means nothing to God without brokenness. Brokenness and contrition. Submitting everything to God and allowing him to lead the way. Knowing how helpless you are without the impute of his spirit. Brokenness. It happens only in the secret place. It happens in the secret place. That's what the Bible says. The one that dwells in the secret place will say of the Lord, you are my refuge. You are my God. You are this. You are that. In whom will I trust? Because he has developed confidence. That's what God calls brokenness. Brokenness. If you read, if you read um, Second Chronicles chapter twenty-six, you see a man that God helped because he was broken. Uzziah. The Bible says, as long as he sought the Lord, as long as he sought the Lord in the understanding of Zechariah, the Bible says God helped him, made him to prosper. 
But the scripture says, if you read down the line, that when God has finished helping Uzziah, what did he do? His heart was lifted. Pride came in. And he began to, he wanted to do things that God did not ordain him to do. And God struck him with leprosy. He was a blessed king, but afflicted. Why? Because of disobedience. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Another thing is love. You see, everything you do for the kingdom is driven by love. That's what God defines as humility. Jesus had a secret place. Jesus was a broken individual because he depended on God. He said, of my own self, he said, I can do nothing. Really? He said, of my own self, I can do nothing. But was that true humanly? But he was speaking from the realm of the spirit that I needed to depend and rely on God to get anything to happen in my life. He said, as I hear, I judge. And my judgment is true. He said, I will not do anything except his will. Love. Love drives everything. That's why that bond servant, even when he's been released, he didn't want to go. He still came back. He said, no, I love my master. In Exodus chapter 21, I love my master, I love my wife, I love my children. I will remain. And the Bible says, the master will take him to judges and will become servant forever. That is what God has called us to do for the kingdom. Praise the Lord. Another thing is honor. Another thing that shows how broken, how humble you are is honor. Let me tell you something. Just we close in the next two minutes, two, three minutes. Now, honor is something that a lot of Christians don't approach intelligently. As far as this earth is concerned, the rising of men is through men. So long as this earth remains, the rising of men is through men. You see, the rising comes from God, but it's routed or channeled through men. Honor. We must learn how to honor people that we're supposed to honor. Honor is one thing that shows, you see, it works in, in both ways. You need men here to rise. Because Paul said, with, without any contradiction, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 7, without any contradiction, he said, the lesser is blessed of the better. Without any contradiction. I mean, considering all factors and analyzing them, is I came to a conclusion that the lesser is blessed by the better. You know why? The heaven is the Lord, the Bible says. But the earth, what has happened? Has he given to the children of men? That was why when Jesus came here, the Bible said he needed favor from God and from men. Why? He needed favor from men. Why? He is God, incarnate. He needed favor from men. He couldn't even find expression on earth until an angel came and looked for somebody. Mary. If Mary had said no, he would have elongated the time. There are legalities in territories. Earth is a territory. And it has a law. If you abuse it, it will be difficult. You see, you've got to understand how to navigate through these two words. Spirit word and here. Jesus said, you're not here, but, you know, you, you, uh, let me not go there. Let me not go there. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We have to understand how to honor men. You remember um, Korah, Dathan, and who else now? On. You remember them? Numbers chapter 20, is it 16? Numbers 16. You remember that? Yes. Numbers chapter 16. The Bible said they rose up one day to challenge Moses. They didn't, know, they didn't understand honor. In the end of that whole di- uh, d- drama, what happened? The Bible said the, the earth opened and swallowed everything they had because they didn't understand that in this realm, you need to honor people. Even if you don't understand, don't talk about it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Then the last one is relationship with the Holy Spirit. These are the things that will give you power to sustain humility in your life. The Bible says through the Holy Ghost, Jesus offered himself to the cross through the Holy Spirit. He would not have done it without the power or empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Can we rise up?